Hi everyone, uh, thanks for attending this talk. Uh, let me introduce you our next speaker, Stiller Zell from Hungary. Uh, he is a DevOps change agent and a test coach in Nokia Mobile Network. And he will present us the cornerstone of DevOps testing. Please welcome. Thank you very much. It's pretty hard to stand here right after lunch. So I try to wake you up a little bit. Unfortunately, this material contains best practices, okay? So you say. Disclaimer. I mean reference for best practices, but of course they are just good practices, as we learned in the morning. So it's my pleasure to be here on the very first Yerevan testing days. I think it, we, it was in, in Brussels when we discussed with Arthur first on testing conference and how to do it, and we met there in ISTQB. So it's very good to see that how many of you are here and, and you know, learning testing and enjoying us, enjoying us talking and enjoying you learning. So I hope I can give you some advice and some good hints on the testing aspects of DevOps, uh, especially how we do it in Nokia, and I will tell a little bit about all the things. But a little bit about myself. I'm uh, from Hungary originally, but now I'm living in Finland. So yesterday when I started to come here, it was minus one, still ice on the cars. So you can imagine how much I love being here in the sun. Finland is like flat like a table, so, and I looked out seeing the beautiful mountain. You have a beautiful country. Let's see. <laughs> I have a flight, actually. Already on the airport, they were asking if I have a ticket back. I said yes. <laughs> Good. So I'm working for Nokia. I'm a DevOps change agent currently. I'm also working on SAFE transformation, SAFE is Scaled Agile Framework, and I'm uh, teaching SAFE. I'm working there with Nokia for more than 19 years now, mainly in software testing. I started as a tester, I was doing real things, not nowadays. <laughs> uh, my focus is more on process improvement. And uh, I have a hobby, hobby is software testing. So due to that, I joined the Hungarian testing board back in 2009 and 2000 somewhere 14 or 15, 14. I became the president of the Hungarian testing board, so working for ISTQB as well. And this was my role until last December when actually I moved, last year I moved to Finland. So, you know, it's not really healthy that the president of a board is not in that country. So I'm collecting certifications, that's a hobby, right? Stupid like that, but at least I'm proud of the uh, expert level certificate of ISTQB. And why I'm proud of it? Because I failed the exam. <laughs> First time I failed it, it takes two times three and a half hours. Pretty hard. But that's actually not the point to take the exam. The point is that I learned a lot that I used also, which I will present here that the knowledge we used, so really practice that from improving the test process certification. But the real thing actually I'm collecting is Lego sets, okay? I have more than 100,000 brick, so I'm a little bit of a gamer as well. Now about to uh, Nokia. Who ha we, we discussed about good phones, right? No one voted for Nokia. <laughs> yeah, I have a Nokia phone, surprisingly. but. You know that Nokia is actually not in the phone business anymore. The Nokia phone is not a Nokia phone. It's a UMD company, that's the name, UMD, and uh, we are licensing them the phones. Nokia is now more on mobile networks. One of the biggest area of Nokia is mobile networks. And I'm working there, it's 20,000 people. So when we talk about KPIs, I think we have at least one per person. Metrics, KPIs. I mean, it's giant. But what Nokia does and what is uh, how we see the future. So on one hand, the future will have a lot of network and computation and storage 
broadband everywhere. That's the challenge we need to serve. Broadband everywhere. You want to have a kind of power plant in your pocket. Massive scale access. I mean, we will, we talk about 5G. 5G will be everywhere. And if you ask the Nokians, we have to say 5G. Okay, so I'm seeing that. I said that, everyone's seen it, okay? 5G is, you know, the future, and actually it will bring you so much power in your pocket and so much connectivity, so low latency, that everything is actually all about that. Internet of things, we will have trillions of connected things like these, but I've seen guys with smart rings as well. They will be connected to the network and everything else. Augmented intelligence, I mean, we will really work with human assistant and task automation on the machine scale. There are, uh, in, in Oulu, in the uh, northern part of, of Finland, there are already uh, hospitals where there are hundreds of robots running around using all the 5G system of us and, and uh, automation, helping the assistant to collect actually pharmacy, I mean tablets, tablets, not tablets, but the pills. So that they are really giving the right dose to the patient. And that's also with this. Human machine interaction, very important. Again, a lot of automation of uh, companies and production, factory automation. Some of the big harbors in Finland are already using our 4G, 5G-ish technology to control all those uh, uh, big, 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 big things, crates moving the heavy weights. Yep. This will also change our way, I mean currency, digitalization of everything. Now I came here with no actual money, right? I mean. I still have some euros in my pocket, but really not using that. I'm using my phone to pay. But soon it will be not even euro connected to it, right? Some cryptocurrency, and I will be happily paying wherever. But that needs consistent connection all the time. Again, back to the mobile network, back to the basics. And digitalization, as I mentioned, we are working on that. So Nokia is very much heavily involved in this area. And a lot of, we are, we are selling not only to operators anymore, so not like mobile vendors, but also to uh, different industries who are utilizing our network in-house. So actually you can put a base station on the wall and then you have an in-house uh, network or fire uh, department. Whenever there's a case, there's a problem, they just send up a, a drone with a 4G network and then they have immediate coverage there what is needed for their communication. So these are things that we are providing and all in the future. Good, but that was about introducing Nokia. So we are not the mobile phone company anymore, okay? 100,000 people working on a lot of mobile technology related stuff. So what I would like to tell today about is DevOps in a nutshell. Then I will say that uh, how we do a DevOps assessment. I'm in a DevOps center of excellence team. And that's our task actually to help others. Uh, if, they, if you ask them, maybe they feel it differently, but this is what we feel. We are helping them to go on the DevOps transformation journey. Then I will go into the details, a little bit of testing aspects, some of the areas, and then of course a little bit of a takeaway. So what is DevOps? DevOps is a set of practices, actually. There is no one definition of DevOps, so I will not give you one either. A set of practices, lean practices, Kaizen, Agile, everything to help collaboration. And actually, the biggest part of DevOps is culture. It's the culture of collaboration, working together, learning very quickly, failing very quickly, and doing the things better based on that. In telco, it's a little bit of a different word. We continuously develop software and continuously deploy software into operations. But in the telco world, we are not owning the equipment. So Nokia is not owning the equipment. It's another company. And many times, actually, mixed with totally different vendors, Huawei, Ericsson, 
other uh, companies' network. So you are actually not in charge of this part, not fully. So you need to be very clever. How do you utilize the technology to collect information, telemetry information, monitoring data, and uh, actually how you analyze the system, how it behaves? I believe we have a complex problem, not complicated, hopefully not chaotic. I believe it's complex. Now, in DevOps, again, we try to get closer the development and the operations through many different aspects. We will discuss those through a little bit. But actually, I would like to talk about DevOps from a different point of view. And this is from the DevOps handbook. And it's described in the three ways. The first way is the principle of flow. This is coming actually from Lean. So in the principle of flow, you need to make sure that you are providing value to your end user and customer continuously. In small batch, in small chunk of work. So, you know, we had the typical project work in Nokia. It's like planning for six months, trying to implement for another six, 12 months, and then trying to solve all the quality issues with testing in the last one month. You can still use your mobile phones, so the networks are still okay. But of course, this speed is not enough anymore. You need, you need much more speed. Think of that, that, for example, a competition, another operator, for example, using Ericsson or Huawei equipment, is coming up with a new feature. So you walk to Nokia and say that, hey, I want this very sexy feature. I want something similar. Please deliver it to me. And then we say, oh, yeah, you know, the next release is coming 2021. And if you are lucky, maybe we can prioritize this. And then learning from the past, maybe we can deliver it in. OK? So that's the story we don't want anymore. It's obvious that you can't do that. You need to be much faster. So whenever there is actually not a push from you to develop, but a pull from the customer, a request to do something, you need to provide that value extremely fast. Maybe just a chunk of a value, so-called minimum viable product, something that is already helping the customer in some way. Now, also with this principle, it's very important that you are working really according to the built-in quality Best practice, no, practice. Keeping it in mind that uh, you never let any fault or try not to let the fault going downstream. You try to capture the fault where you are. Faults in requirement, faults in implementation, faults in integration, faults in deployment, anything. So try not to let it go down. That's also part of the first principle. Here, we try to optimize the system. Not what we do, typically, that optimize the silo. It works for me. My metrics are good. My targets I reached. I'm so happy. Just it doesn't work at the customer, or it's just full of bugs. Here, you need to focus on optimizing the whole stream end to end. Now, being able to take needless work out of the system is more important than being able to put more work into the system. Jim Kim, one of the, let's say, guy behind DevOps, and he is one of the writer of the DevOps handbook as well, he quoted this, which actually means also that the lean mindset. You try to optimize by reducing waste. Not like pushing the people, motivating them, to do more work, but trying to remove unneeded, unnecessary work. Now, capturing a fault late, creating a bug report, creating a correction, deploying it to production, now that's waste. Okay, so even removing fault earlier, shift left, is kind of an idea also to remove waste. The second principle is about the feedback. The second way is the principle of feedback. Now, you need to have feedback from any state of the work, any place. So 
If you do requirements, get the feedback if the requirements are right. We also learned that actually you, we, we cannot have all the requirements well, so we need to understand actually what the customer wants, what is the problem that we try to solve with a solution. Development, have feedback immediately. Continuous integration, automated testing is required for that. Whenever the coder, the developer is pushing a piece of code to, to uh, uh, I'm not saying branch, but in the CI to trunk, so to the, to the main branch, hopefully, you need to give very quick feedback. Now, in Nokia, we have a testing phase, which is called field verification. Now, the system under test, or the test environment, is ESPO. It's a city. So we have a test network, actually, out in the city. So the test happens like guys sit in the car and start driving around and taking measurements. And it takes a couple of days, hours, to go around and, and, and do the testing. Now, how do you make quick feedback on that? And then, of course, it's a good excuse why not to try it to give fast feedback. We rather say in testing that, you know, my testing phase is so complicated or complex or whatever that I cannot automate, I cannot get, give fast feedback. I just need to do that old, slow, manual thingy. No. It's important to have feedback from every aspect of the development and every testing stage. Again, in a telecom, there's a lot of different testing stages. Field verification is just one of them. Performance verification, when Quality criteria is that you need to run the traffic profile for five days. We said, oh, can you give me feedback in one hour? You know, it's five days. But can you give in one hour? You know what, we can. We did some machine learning algorithms where it's checking all the logs and how the system goes and with roughly 80%, after one hour, it can tell you if the whole sequence of five days execution will fail or not. So actually you can give fast feedback. So the principle of feedback to build in everywhere is very important. Improving daily work is even more important than do, doing their daily work. Of course, why we have feedback? To learn, right? To improve our way of working. So you can have a feedback if the other side doesn't care about it. Now also in DevOps, if we work together, collaborate together with the developers, with the customer, it's always feedback and it's always fast feedback. Do I understand correctly what you want? Is this the way you think it should work? That's already kind of testing and also generating feedback. And the third way, the principle of continual learning and experimentation. So it's not enough to have the feedback it must be a continuous learning and also continuous exploration, experimentation. There was very good talk about that in the morning, right? That it's not enough to do things what you always do and repeat that. You need to do things that you have never tried. You need to do exploratory testing. You need to do bug hunting, for example. Bug hunting is my favorite, actually. That's, that's one of the topics I introduced in Nokia. And it's just fun. OK, but that's another talk. Experimentation also is needed. I mean, that needs management to accept failure. Now, here's the point when we are not talking anymore about testing, right? Here's the point when it's culture. Is it OK to fail? What was the last time, or I'm asking that in the last year, which of you have celebrated failure? One, two, three, okay. Not so many, right? It's still not the culture of celebrating failure, saying that, you, we failed. It's lovely. We lost a couple of millions. Woo! But what can you learn from it? Can you learn? Can you utilize that not to make the same mistake again? 
Of course you can. Just need to grow up to that, that it's an opportunity, actually. So failure is good. Now you will go back to management and say, oh, I learned failure is good. So tomorrow, it's a day for failure. You know, do bug hunting, and then it will be a rather lot of failures there. Good. Uh, so one thing also with this uh, area, if you can't out experiment your competition and beat them in time to market and agility, you are sunk. We are competing on the market, right? Software is extremely fast piece, something that, that you need to be fast. And that means you need to try out new things. DevOps is a platform to fail quickly. DevOps is a platform to try out your new idea on the field and see if it works or not. A-B testing. You bring two versions, two solutions for a problem, and you check which one is used more, which one is really uh, bringing you the benefit that you, you had as a hypothesis. And then you will see, okay, this was better, so I'll go with that. You know what's in there? If you go with A, you have to scrape idea B. You delete it. You don't use it anymore. Management might say, oh my god, it's a waste of effort. But actually, you learned a lot from that. So also, that is, that is a good thing to go A-B testing here. And again, that's a continuous learning. So DevOps is a platform for continuous learning. So again, DevOps needs a lot of cultural change. DevOps needs a lot of collaboration. DevOps, of course, needs a lot of automation, a lot of other techniques. And it can build on the freeways. Now, DevOps assessment. Why do we need that? You know, if you have a small team, maybe you send the people to a training and they learn about DevOps and they come back and also start experimenting themselves, building a pipeline from all open source stuff, automating things, deploy, fail, deploy again, fail again. They do that many times and ba ba, after a while you might have a good DevOps team. Now try to do this with 20, 22,000 people. I don't know how many countries we have actually, all around the world. Now it's hard. So because of that, uh, we were bringing or we created a so-called DevOps center of excellence as a driver of change, as a, as a change agent center, something. One of our tasks is to train people, create training programs for management, leadership, change, education, and also for engineers. Now the other thing what we do, for example, is uh, doing with our customers value stream design and value stream mapping workshops to streamline processes. You know, if you want to automate a process, it's better you optimize first the process and only after that you automate. So that's also a service what we do. But the last service is the assessment itself. So we have a DevOps assessment meaning that trying to check what is your status and where do you want to go. And I said I have the expert level education in test process improvement where actually we studied a lot of maturity models. And this was the place uh, where I used it, where we, we, it, it was actually useful, that knowledge. We checked a lot of assessments on the market. The scared agile framework just come up last year, I think, with this health radar. Then Cloud Bees also have the DevOps Squadrant maturity model. On the left, we have just a generic, normal kind of five level uh, maturity model. We checked quite many things. And of course, because we are Nokians, we said, it doesn't work here. We need to create our own stuff. So we started to work on that and created our own DevOps maturity model. In the, in the center of excellence team. Now, the maturity model is trying to cover uh, the different continuous everything, thing is of the software development life cycle. Like continuous planning, continuous coding building, like the agile development. So th those things that are within the agile development. 
then checking the continuous integration capability as well. So continuous integration, I think I don't need to say what is it, but you integrate every piece of the code continuously, every user story continuously as a product. We are working with giant features and people love to say, oh, my feature is done. And then this feature is done, and this feature is done, and this feature is done, and they are coming together and nothing works. Because it was not integrated to a product, so the whole feature was never tried together, or some minor interworking problems or problems in interworking, like if this feature is on and this feature is on, ouch. Now when you develop a product for 20 years, then you turn out to have quite a lot of legacy, which no one knows how it works. So testing again and continuous testing and testing inside continuous integration again becomes very important. Continuous delivery. Continuous delivery is kind of a principle and again a mindset when you can deploy from your trunk at any given time. When there is a request to deploy your code, you are able to do it from the trunk. Your code quality is always on production level. But this is still on demand, right? And with continuous deployment, if there is a code change, it's automatically deployed into production. So that's the difference between the continuous delivery and the continuous deployment. With the delivery, there's still a pool. There is still a manual check. With deployment, it goes through the, the channel. Some of the operators have to tell to the government six months before they update their mobile network. Okay? So I think we need a continuous warning process, like we will deliver tomorrow and the day after and the day after and the day after, because you need to have that time. Even legal framework is not really there in telco to do this. But operators are willing to ask us at least to deploy to their testing lab. So they want to see how it works. They want to integrate it to their lab. Maybe not to the whole country, but just some areas, some radio. Continuous monitoring, you need to have that, right? You need telemetry services. You need to understand if your system is still working or not. I deploy this feature, so what? How do you know what's going on? Do you you need to have a lot of analytics and data and logging and whatever in the system, right, to see that. I loved some pictures from Spotify when, when they had this kind of continuous monitoring. Uh, the Google Play and the Apple Store comments for all the one star, you know, the, the bad com uh, feedback, they put on a big dashboard. So you push the code, it went out, People started to install that. People started to hate your correction or your software, and they gave you the feedback, and it was into your face. That's a way of continuous monitoring as well. Now, with the mobile networks, again, it's not so easy. My team was once in a, in a newspaper. It was not so funny, actually. It was in France. A small village had no water. Okay, no water, so what? Like, but the connection. Now it turned out that their pumps were connected through mobile data connection, 2G still, and because of the 2G connection was down, there was no control of the water pump, so there was no water in the village. It was my team. Now, that was quite of a slow feedback, actually, but uh, that's also a feedback channel. Now, in continuous monitoring, you really want something proactive. So you want to know much faster that there's a problem than your customer, than the end user. When there are degradation in, for example, voice quality or latency starting to grow or your system just start to use more CPU, more memory, whatever, you want to know about that and you want to be proactive. And then actually building on all this, DevOps is building on all this and saying that, okay, after we have all of these, let's have the ability to change things quickly. 
Now, when I say ability, it also means that the teams are allowed to make decisions. Oh my God, this telemetry data is going to the wrong direction. Do I need to call the boss who calls the boss who calls the boss if we can change the code to change? I mean, come on. This must be, again, the culture of DevOps as well. OK, so when you look into an organization, how they work, and you want to see how ready they are for DevOps, these are all the areas, again, you want to see, you want to look into. Um, then we were thinking on what kind of maturity model to use or how to you know, think about that. Of course, this level five is easy. Again, sorry to blame the management so much. I'm actually one of them. But we have this very good hand, right? It's five. So level, five levels, it's just easy to understand. We like that. Um, and then the categories. This we selected like uh, in, the, in the TPI next, for example, where there are key areas. Here we have the 12 key areas. Culture and organization. So of course we check the culture. Uh, the assessment is, by the way, interview based. So we went and talked to people and interviewed them and, and, and tried to get a good understanding how the things are going. Also, there's a survey, so question answered. You will reveal a lot of things based on this as well. Planning and requirements. How much you have feedback to the planning? How much you have feedback to the requirements? How well the requirements are actually visible? Probably you would say, oh, come on, it's easy. We have JIRA, and then when I move that JIRA ticket, then everything is visible immediately, and all the tests are connected, and all the, yeah. If you are not 20,000 people, and if you are not working with a hell lot of legacy and, and, and many tools, and does anyone know DOORS as a requirement management system? A few, a few who are old enough for that, right? So it might not be created for Agile, let's put it that way. Of course, it was very good for telco origin requirements, but when you want all the traceability there, requirements up to testing, up to everything, it's not easy to add. Software configuration management. Again, we are talking about giant software, so SCM is extremely important. How do you handle it? How do you put together the components? How do you do versioning? Who does SCM? Where it happens? In the cloud? Not in the cloud? Manually? Automatically? Et cetera, et cetera. A lot of things. Continuous integration, we check that. A lot of practices there that needs to be assessed. Quality assurance and verification. I wanted to call it testing, but then people doesn't understand. So we, we come up with this fancy name of QNAV. Why not? Quality assurance and verification, so actually that's my part, that's, that's what, what I did. Architecture of the, of the system. Now, can you deploy something with a monolithic architecture? How can you change it? You change here, it's broken there, right? So DevOps even needs a much better architecture, microservice architecture, cloud, whatever. Actually, all these are enablers. You know, it's so good. We did assessment and we said, oh, guys, you have bare metal move to the cloud. It's easy. I get my payment. I walk away. I gave the idea to them. And they said, oh, yeah, in 10 years, we can move the radio to the cloud. Well, so at least some kind of architecture should be in place. Uh, if not mar mar microservices, still some kind of smaller services that you can do changes locally. OK, visibility. This might be uh, different. It was not on the, on the previous pictures. Visibility is about information flow. It's about how well the information is available, how fresh is the information. Do you need special you know, uh, account to reach it? So it's a lot of dashboard. It's actually, we are checking how well the information is provided about all the others. Upgradability, software maintenance, monitoring, and feedback. So this is already on the deployment part of the product, right? How do you deploy? How do you maintain your product? System integration, it's also like how do you integrate your whole system together, like the mobile network? How do we do that? How easy it is to do? Again, if this is like requiring six months planning, and then I don't know how many months of implementation typing 
into the console things that probably you will not have DevOps, not even Agile, right? And then the others, these are network implementation, network planning and optimization. These are very much telco things as well on, on the ops side. So these are the 12 categories we selected. And what does it help us? Okay, sorry for that. It, it helps us to look from the inside, actually. So now you, you will have this radar picture of how well you are actually following those good practices. I'm not allowed to say best practices anymore. How do you follow the good practices, what we kind of defined, and, and we, we came from different le uh, lecture literature and, and practices around the organization? And how do you see, actually, show to management where are the gaps? So when we did an assessment, this is like what we get. This is a kind of line, a middle line, which we say that if you are on level three, then you would be able to go DevOps already. But if, if you want to reach that, then these are, for example, here the two areas where you need to focus on. Management always wants, give me three things I need to focus on, and then it's easy, right? If I say, you know, we have brilliant ideas how you can improve your planning and requirements. They say, okay, but there's not, that's not the problem, right? So maturity model actually helps you to know where I am now, where I want to get, and how do I get there? That's the whole point of a maturity model. Now, this is just a little bit looking into the thing. So we have categories in uh, the 12 categories. Within that, we have key areas, and within there, sorry, we have best practices. And then e in each of them, we are defining like levels, how well that practice is in place. Now, yes, and we use actually the, the kind of Six Sigma uh, CD, CM, okay. DMAIC, D-M-A-I-C, uh, define, measure, analyze, implement, and check to go through what does it actually mean. We start the assessment, we measure, we do the assessment itself, we define what to do, uh, guys start implementation, and actually we do a reassessment to close it to see how well it, it goes. Also, of course, there are metrics that we measure on top of that. So now this is the DevOps assessment as a, as a high level look. This is what we built. We have done assessment for, I think, something like covering 9,000 people. So organizations we've been mobile network to, to cover this much. As, of course, not interviewing everybody, right? It's like selective areas. Now the testing part, so the QNAV, quality assurance and verification. There I defined five areas. Actually, it was much more, but then we started to cut them back. Test first thinking, continuous product level quality assurance, uh, and the rest, I will go into this one now deeply, and then let's see how well we can go into the others. So for test first thinking, we have three practices. Feature level acceptance criteria are defined upfront. All type of the tests are identified upfront, collaboratively, and then testing is guided by risk levels. There were more. And I'm absolutely ready to get feedback as well. There were more, uh, but we kind of prioritized based on discussion that we are to stick to, what should be the ones that we are focusing on. Now, I believe that when we focus on the acceptance testing part and on, on the testing and also this kind of all tests are identified upfront and the others are kind of discussed collaboratively, that part is, uh, something to be discussed with the testing pyramid. So we, need, we know we have the business focus and the technology focus, or at least I like this pyramid because it tells you that this is typically what the kind of acceptance criteria user stories are telling about, and this is what, as a tester, you should know about. From the failures, from, from the previous happenings, from all you know, the bad things, continuous learning. And of course, this might be also the, the requirements and other things. Now, acceptance testing are focusing on, for example, the, the business focus. ATDD or BDD can be utilized, even resulting in automated acceptance tests. It is typically focusing on the functional aspects. Now, the next one I love to focus on, on covering the risks. All the 
things that could go wrong. Failure modes and running FMEA, failure mode and effect analysis, capturing negative scenarios and doing risk-based testing. So utilizing risk-based testing to focus your testing effort. Specification-based testing, I put it like the big bulk of that when you are really following up on all the requirements. Again, we are in TACO, so we have very detailed technical requirements down to earth. All of them must be covered. Here we do a lot of requirement-based test design and, and applying those. This also focusing on the non-functional testing. And the last but not least, exploratory testing, where you focus on, for example, rainy day scenarios, but actually preserving the knowledge. So help, exploratory testing also helps you to learn continuously, right? It's like how you will learn your system, how it actually behaves. It gives you a lot of chance to go around. I love to put this on, on, on the test design techniques to make sure that we don't forget about manual exploratory testing. F focusing only on automation and making sure you know everything is automated is a wrong target because then you are losing the exploratory testing part. Now, one thing with that, we discussed about deploying into production, right? And in TACO, you need to test also in the customer environment. So through our DevOps pipeline, we actually deploy our products into the test environment, the lab environment of our customers, operators. And we also deploy tests there. We want to have automated testing. But the customers were asking us that, are you really want to test everything again in my network? Then we said no. We focus on the acceptance test and some part of the rest. This is deployed. Now, this also means that you need to understand upfront what are the things that you want to deploy, or during the testing what you learn, you need to automate, and then you need to make it deployable. It's kind of a big challenge in, in TACO, especially when you need special hardware to test the software. So you need to have the hardware already in there, and then you deliver new software, you deliver new test cases, you deliver new test environment parameters, infrastructure as a code. So there's a lot of techniques that you need to have here. Good. The other part is risk-based testing. We discussed that, and I think you have an idea about that. So picking up different features, for example, and putting on a risk map, like what is the likelihood of failure and what is the impact of a failure. And then, for example, feature seven, you focus on that much more or quality criteria, like typically in TACO, in the network side, usability would be somewhere here. You know, read the manual. I don't want to give you beautiful user interface. It's anyway techie guys who are controlling the equipment. So we don't focus. But reliability, that's one of the highest expectation to have. So then this gives you an understanding again how to test and where to test. And I love to put the failure modes as well on here. What could go wrong and how much it could go wrong? Is your product capable of killing people? How? What's the probability? Then, of course, the impact is high already. So maybe some failure modes are here. So understanding these during also agile development and throughout the iterations gives you also the, the possibility to focus your testing. OK, this is just uh, an idea after you have identified the testing you know, risk level, then you can state how deep and how wide you will, you will test it. This is coming actually from Rex Black. Good. Uh, one example for this from our maturity model would be if I say that feature level acceptance criteria I defined up front. So we said that on level one, which is not really DevOps-ish, we would say that acceptance criteria are defined on release level only. Release for us is a project, okay? So actually, we are not saying when a feature is done. Only when the project is done, if there was 100 feature in it, or the 100 is done. That's very waterfall, right? So that's typically what we don't want to see. Guess what? We have a lot of this. Uh, consistency, acceptance criteria, oh, sorry, level two, acceptance criteria are defined 
on feature level, but only within the development iteration. I mean, this is a little bit late. This is not giving you a chance to, to focus your effort around that. So we said that what we want is more that the acceptance criteria are defined upfront, collaboratively with everyone there, and even the customer representatives, those teams who are with the customer deployment, so-called DevOps teams or SRE, they are also part of this acceptance criteria definition. And then on level four, so this would be like you, you can go DevOps. This is where you we suggest you can start. Level four would be going further, improving. So saying that let's have uh, accept the requirements defined in the format of acceptance test, ATDD. Okay, you didn't give me the five minutes warning. Oh shit, okay. So ATDD and BDD would be the, the, the technique here. And of course, if we want to go more, it would mean that you are having requirements defined as test cases, right? For example, like robot test cases. So executable acceptance test driven development is the thing. I mean, we said it's in the future somewhere. That's the kind of a direction you want to go for. Okay. so. We have other areas as well. I didn't go deep in those. I didn't even plan to go, but it's like product level quality assurance, so not feature level, but checking the whole product, uh, utilizing the lowest possible test level, so how much shift left actually you have, how well you automate all the testing tasks, and I'm not saying test execution, any testing task, how well it's automated. And the last one is kind of sharing the tools and the test assets across the value chain between organizations and even up to customers. These were, as said, originally there, we, we had much more. We selected these as the main focus area to look for. And already with this, we could see many organizations and give them ideas where to focus. So before the sum up summary slide, we said that DevOps in DevOps testing is a value-driven role, and tester is a value-driven role in the DevOps team who is collaborating throughout, uh, sorry, who are driven by knowing the risk, yeah, providing quick feedback on development. And I think this sentence is somehow broken. Okay, sorry, something is wrong there. So the point is, the tester is the one giving feedback. The tester is the one knowing how it works with the customer. The tester is helping reusing assets and tools. It's collaborating and it's a valuable asset. And the negative part was like, testing is the bottleneck. It's always, you know, the, the, the guy who is bringing the bad news. So that's typically not what you want. You want to see tester as a collaborative member of the organization. So key takeaways. If you have a big transformation, it's very probable that you need to have a dedicated team helping on that. Education is important, change agents you need. And if you have a dedicated team, they can really focus on learning these areas. You need to study available maturity models and pick them, pick any of them if they are good for you, but dare to build your own. If that's serving your purpose best, but really, there are very good maturity models out there, so feel free to use them. Automation is key in DevOps testing, but it's not everything. There's a lot more than automation out there that you need to check. And continuous exploration and learning is a must. Also, even in a maturity model creation, we are coming back learning how to improve our maturity model and how to you know, put even more information into it or better or even removing something which turns out to be stupid. So have a very good DevOps journey. I wish you a good journey and I wish you a good testing of everything. Thank you very much. Maybe a few minutes remain for that. Oh, so many are here. Someone had a good dream. <laughs> you still have a Nokia.
Oh. <laughs> the last two guys, right? <laughs> So thank you for the presentation. And oh, yeah. I have a quick question. Uh, oh, a question. Regarding, uh, so you, you mentioned over there you had the Q, A, and B cycle. Yeah. And generally when you, we verify things, we verify that what we built was according to the specs and the requirements. And then there's, especially with Nokia, a larger company, there's this aspect of validation that yeah. we may want to make sure what we built was the right thing that we built. And so how, how does validation work into the DevOps cycle if it does, or if, if that's an external uh, factor that you guys don't take into consideration? Um, actually, this acronym was not really seriously taken into uh, consideration if we have only verification, not validation. But uh, the validation is really happening at the customer lab, typically. So we have pilots, we work together with them, we show the features and they give the feedback on that. Many times actually the validation turns to be only a, a technical validation, which is actually verification. So like, is it broken? Is it, and many times it's like, you know, you build this feature to solve a business problem. Did you actually solve that problem? Uh, that's a challenge still to really get there. People, especially again with the big, big, big organization, I'm in this, silo in this role, I'm in this role, I'm in this role, and no one is actually in the validation role anymore. But uh, talking to customer, having that aspect is very important. I, I didn't show that we have a kind of topology for customer collaboration. How do we work with them? And, and uh, it, it's like putting the Nokia people and the customer people actually into one team. They have the same rights. They can do the same things together. And that's where you learn about the feedback, the validation actually about the feature. Any questions? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.